this question here is basically on the cells that you guys had made, right? Because uh, the artist that kind of donated the hundred thousand dollars, I mean that, you know, that's payment to the gallery or whatever expenses, or, or whatever expense they cover. Like, um, so I think that was kind of like a mentoring thing and a relationship that kind of grew that, right? But um, how did you guys get your customers? How did you go about? You know, if it's Adrian, I guess it might be uh, what you curated before, or you know, what projects you've been a part of, right? Which is actually like the art. I mean, it's actually kind of like the promotion or the strategy to kind of get something else, right? I'll answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I don't have a, a client base necessarily, and that question sounds like my family members. Whenever I'm in an exhibition, the question is always, did you sell anything? So the answer to that, in the last show that I was in, I did actually sell something. But my work, because some of it, a lot of it is more installation-based, um, space is often an issue. It can be a little esoteric for people. It isn't necessarily work that sells, except in the case of Victor's auction, where Cicely asked for a piece of my work, and Victor was convinced that both Cicely and I, who were agreeing, had lost our minds, but it did in fact sell, and it went into a very significant collection <laughs> here at Rutgers University. And I forgot to mention that I actually do, I am employed here at Rutgers in Paul Robeson Gallery, so I teach sometimes, I work in the um, arts workshops, and I've also had an opportunity through seed grants from the Chancellor's Office to curate exhibitions. I submitted proposals to curate exhibitions. So this space has been, this this university and this space have been uh, significant spaces for me. But what I was going to say is that, yes, the, the, what I was going to say is that the artwork, while it doesn't sell necessarily, it leads to other opportunities. So there's always that, hopefully. So. One thing I want to add to that is that um, that that there and you hinted on it that you, you use the word revenue streams that artists that all of the revenue that comes in that supports you as an artist is not always from art sales. Um, some of you may be familiar with the artist Willie Cole, who is a friend of mine. He started out very early in the eighties. Willie. Most people don't know had a gallery called uh, Works Gallery, which was on Long Lane, just across the track. Long Lane doesn't exist anymore, but but Willie, um, you know, confided to me one year that he made more money going on lectures talking about art than he made selling art. So artists um, write, artists publish, artists um, uh, do a number of different things. I mean from waiting tables as a young artist to you know um, working as an adjunct professor or or they do workshops my co-founder of Aljara you know Carl Hazelwood um, in the past couple of years has gone to every major residency in the country and outside of the country. I mean, he's gone to Dora Mars, you know, Picasso's, you know, lover or wife's house in, in Europe. He's gone to Yaddo, he's gone to, I mean, every major residency. And, you know, some residencies, the Joan Michel Foundation has got a residency so in New Orleans. And, you know, some residencies come with space, they come with live work space, some residencies come with a stipend. So, so the revenue is not just coming from one place. It's coming. There are multiple revenue streams that support artists. Um, I remember um, talking to uh, Amiri Baraka, who I supported um, as a visual artist, and Amiri had a baseline of of revenue that came in from. I mean, he was a prolific writer. He had over forty-five publications. So. He had royalties coming in, but it was not enough to support all the things that Amiri did. So, and he had an entrepreneurial side, very entrepreneurial side. So, what would happen is that there was this art, artist 
in New York City by the name of Camille Billups. Camille um, started something called, and starting organizations too, she, she had something called the Hatch Billups Foundation, which interviewed artists and it was an archive uh, that sort of kept records, particularly of artists who were obscure or minority or unknown. It wasn't limited to people of color, but, but Camille had this knack. And Camille would come to Penn Station, I'd pick Penny up, We'll go to Amiri's house. Amiri would come down with two shopping bags. This stuff was terrible. <laughs> but, I mean, he would do drawings. He would use stuff that kids use, and he would do it on invitations. He would do it on bad pieces of paper. But Camille had a way of packaging these things and framing them and presenting them to the world. And it's amazing when she was done with them. I mean, they were saleable. And so, Omiri had a sort of another revenue stream going, and Camille used the sales from the stuff that she got from him to produce films. Um, she did a number, Finding Krista was one of her films, It Ain't Just Rednecks is one of her films. I mean, she did a lot of films on women. She did films on, on uh, issues that had to do with, with uh, race in the family. And, and skin color in the family. Um, she died recently, she passed, but she was also a very, very, very loyal and strong supporter of what we did here in New Jersey. And uh, Z, you actually <laughs> So you actually <laughs> produce as well. Right, so another in stream. line with what Victor was saying, uh, you know, completely aside from music is uh, artist merchandise, which is something that merch, merch, the merch table. I mean, the merch table saved or helped make our tour possible because um, even I underestimated, you know, before we went on tour, what we would uh, be able to make with our merch, and it was like four times what I had thought. And you know, now I will reapply that knowledge to the next time I go out, but. I say that to say that, yeah, completely unrelated to music, you can, as a musician, you make any number of things, shirts, stickers, hats, and then you have, you know, your records to sell, and that becomes something that makes your beginning stages of touring possible, for sure. Hey, so, yes. I'm sorry, can I just pull off script for a second? Sure. Okay. Um, Victor brought up um, racism, but we also can't ignore gender bias and the need for support, networks of support, and artists building and becoming part of support organizations, support groups. I was part of uh, Women's Art Collective. I mean, if, if you see statistically, um, you know, while we see lots of, a lot of women and women of color in particular, you know, who are making great strides in the art world, statistically, it is still predominantly a white male dominated industry. And even when you see women who are in particular positions, high level positions within the top tier institutions, when you start looking at who's getting solo shows and who's getting a lot of the attention, it is still white male and male dominated. So I, I just say that there's, there's a need for these support networks. A lot of what I have done in these institutions have been a result of recommendations that were made by other women. What Adrian is talking about is, I mean, it's changing very slowly. There are only about 4% of, of us, people of color, in the business. So the other 96%, I mean, what I mean is that people at all, at all levels, whether they're curators or administrators or artists or whatever, there's only about 4%. And you may see people like Carol Walker, or you may see people like Kinshasa Conwell, or people like, um, mm -hmm. yes, yeah, so you, you may see people who are highly, who've got high profile, right. or you may say, well, I know Faith Ringel, or right. I know, you know, Thelma Golden. Right. But, but those people, when you look at that nationally, 
Or you may say, oh, okay, Hindu Wiley is making right. billions of dollars. Right. Uh, well, you know, but, but when you look at the industry as a whole, there's a very small minority of people who can, who've got, a, you know, who are occupying positions in major institutions, in anchor institutions, who are making a living doing it. I mean, in, in the entire industry, maybe there's 1% of the artists who do nothing but make art. But the point is, is that it's, there's still an equity. And, you know, I agree with that. You know, I think, and without, uh, without, you know, people like you guys fighting for that for us, like we still need, we need, we need to fight for that. What I'm also interested in is, uh, like for me, like him talking about merch and you talking about alternative ways to make money and grants is that, like, if you read about these things, so I've toured, toured the world and did a lot of stuff that he's done, but now that I'm starting to actually study books on independent music and musicians and you know, learning who holds uh, uh, licensing, like my, my publishing company now owns Harry Fox, which does all the licensing, but I wouldn't know that if I had read a book on music, you know, on independent. Just because we're artists, we kind of feel like, you know, someone has to find us and make us this star, but you can kind of like move you know, train forward if you educate yourself on, on these things in which, you know, we, yeah, we all heard about alternative ways of making money today and that and that you kind of have to do these things in the field to kind of be, uh, you know, sustainable or create a sustainable living for yourself as an artist. And um, what uh, Chris and I talk about often is, like, I'm a big fan of Gary Vaynerchuk. I don't know, I'm a big fan of that. But, right, right. It's, it's so many opportunities out there to be an entrepreneur. Aaron would say that as well. Once you realize how to work with social media, there's art being sold online now. You know, it's it's uh, prints. You know, it's art pop-ups. You know, and the biggest thing is I've been seeing is artists kind of creating collectives and, and doing like, you know, Basquiat's first, you know, showing, group showing is what kind of led him to start a, or started to talk, but it was a collective thing, just figuring out how to do whatever within the art, or your art to kind of be noticed, and... Yes, what I want to say is that most, most, one of the things that we found out is that most of your opportunities will come from people in your milieu, people who are other artists, people who, you know, so artists create more opportunities for other artists than anybody else. So, uh, so the net, networking and working, collaborating is like critical to success. Right, because if they get a position, you might have a position, yeah. you know, and vice versa. So now you're working, you know, without like needing to be. And businesses that rely on artists, like right. record shops, working with musicians or right. now music. Right. Right. right, right. So that was a big piece of it. Clap it up for that. That was a message. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is a big comment. This is a big question. How do you separate art from commerce? Did we talk about that a little bit? Yeah, we talked. We covered that. I'm moving around. No, 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 no. I, I, I don't want to address that. Wait, this is a good question. This is good for you. Yeah. Yeah. You're actually like, you're, you're, so, you're, so, you're so good. I will do anything for that. <laughs> no, um. Uh, Victor's first point was, um, you know, asking yourself why you do what you do and what your definition of success is, and I think that answer dictates this question. If your goal in your art is to make money, then you will do what needs to be done to, you know, satisfy the current market. If you, if that isn't your goal, if the success for you is making great works and being recognized by people that you appreciate that aren't necessarily in the market, then you, you know you will do things based on what you believe is good work. And that will be that, and you know maybe you know some people don't those two maybe don't meet sometimes like you know uh, quality and market sellability, but sometimes they do. You know, so I can say, 
as an artist, you, you you do figure out, you were talking about an artist that kind of did his own painting, he didn't step out of the box for that, you know, and I think that's important too, I think, um, for a musician, right, they kind of make it, the standard is Kanye West, right, or the standard is Ben Harper, or the standard is, but, you know, they might be making millions of dollars, can you make a hundred, can you make fifty thousand dollars in what you do in art, you know, figuring that out first, you know, like, can you make a, that's a living, right? So I think we start off with millions of dollars, right? If you're making 100 to $200,000 a year on your, on your art, you, you could probably take care of your family with that, you know? You know? And I think um, ultimately, um, I think you have to figure out what your, what your sound is and what your art is and, and then build the infrastructure around that. Yeah, that's, you know, that's your objective. Yeah, you know, and, and because even if even if sometimes it's, you know, like as musicians, we kind of get off, off the handle of like what we like, right? So I really like this art piece and it's this price, right? Everyone needs to like it because I like it. If they don't like it, they understand. Like, so for me as a business person now, right? I have to say to myself, I have to say to myself that this song here, everyone liked, you know? Should I make more music like this, or should I make music, you know? Yeah. You know, we talked about that too earlier too. We talked about, we talked about, I think my son Adrian talked about that. One of the worst things that can happen to an artist straight out of school is that you become super successful. And what happens is that you don't get a chance to grow. If you make widgets that are red, you would be making those widgets because that's what the market is demanding. And you don't get a chance really to develop your range as an artist because all they want you to do, all the market will, will accept as your work oftentimes is that particular thing. Artists by the name of Al Loving. I remember, and what happens with the market, I, I could talk about the visual arts. What happens with the market is that if you're working with a particular gallery or gallerist, and that gallery starts selling you in advance. So you already sold out for next year and next year. And the customers, you're getting money, you, you know, you, you get it, you're getting checks. And the customers are expecting that you're gonna make, continue to make the same things. Al decided that, you know, hey, I'm not making that over here. And you know what? Castelli said, hey, you can't do that. You already, we already got paid for work you know, for future work. And so you got a problem when, you, when you've got a young artist, like, for instance, we've got a very successful young artist here at Rutgers, Jordan Castile. She came out of the, um, like, you know what, either came out of the Studio Amusement in Harlem, they, you know, Gary James Marshall came out of the Studio Amusement in Harlem. In fact, Gary James Marshall is the artist who sold a piece uh, some years ago for 20, 20 grand or 25,000 and it sold for some 25 million recently. Yeah, yeah, and so, yes, Puffy, yeah, yeah. So the thing about, the thing about, you know, this, this vertical takeoff, success is a kind of thing like, boom, it's got the downside. I think we gotta open up the mic though because yeah, I was gonna say because we have a lot of people in this audience yeah. that I know personally, any one of them could be on this panel. Mm -hmm. And one I know is over there taking copious notes, and I'm sure <laughs> that she had not even so much questions to ask, but things to add to this conversation. Sure. She is yeah. should I introduce her? <laughs> well we we just open up the mic any questions. Thank you for like what you know. This is the part where we kind of ask the questions and give them a round of applause. You guys got to do more panels.